Well, this morning we continue what we've been doing during this month and uh, offering uh, you uh, the opportunity to ask questions you might not have otherwise had the opportunity to ask. <clears throat> and I hope that uh, over the recent weeks we've kind of at least touched on some of them. I appreciate, you can appreciate we won't get to all of them, uh, but we're trying to get those that hopefully are, have a, a broader range of appeal and uh, kind of along the way have answered some questions too. So uh, I can't uh, guarantee that will continue to be the case, but we'll, we'll certainly try. And again, as we go through, uh, I'm going to be uh, giving you some of uh, my personal uh, reflection and opinion, and uh, we, I'm happy to dialogue about that as we talk about the different... Got, I've got a couple of more questions today. Uh, if you want to come and, uh, or, and want to ask a question about that as a follow-up, please do. Just ask that you go to the microphone to do it, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, a couple of... Uh, interesting ones today, at least I think, potential to once again uh, get myself into trouble, but anyway, we'll see how we go. Here's our first question. Could you explain the importance of baptism, and what about christening? Okay. Well, uh, you do appreciate that this, this issue can be uh, a controversial one. I, I don't know how uh, controversial it is for uh, any of you, but uh, it's controversial because there's all there uh, uh, different denominations practice a whole range of uh, different options uh, uh, when it comes to baptism. Some baptize infants, uh, others uh, like churches of Christ uh, baptize when they're older. Some uh, some congregations even almost de-emphasize baptism. So uh, uh, it's probably a, a good issue to uh, to to revisit. And I guess. I'd start, you know, trying to talk about baptism and uh, start with basically asking the question, why do we baptize? Well, I'd say the uh, first and primary reason we baptize is because it was a command of Jesus. It started, you know, you remember it, uh, after Jesus' resurrection, he spent time with the disciples, and then he offered the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Again, those familiar words. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Often when, I come, when, when the whole issue of uh, baptism comes up, what I say to somebody who is uh, perhaps somebody that has just come to faith, you need to realize, or they're considering faith, I say, uh, as you think about baptism, you need to realize it is Jesus' first command in your life. And as you respond to that command, you are, you are setting the precedent of your life and saying that my life is now given to him, I have pledged myself to follow him, and here is a way that I, I express it right from the very beginning by obeying his command to be baptized. Just as he sent the disciples out to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's a command that we, uh, that we uh, uh, believe is imperative for all believers. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Not only is it a command, but, you know, as we go to the book of Acts, it was the practice of the early church. And it started right from the first day and day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You, we read in Acts chapter 2 how Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, proclaimed Jesus to the people, and this is their response. It said, when the people heard this, they, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. So from the very beginning, as people were called to faith, they were called to repent, to, to believe, repent, and be baptized. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, that's not just a formulaic sort of thing. That being baptized into Christ, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's, it means that people are actually taking a step of, of 
being led into a total and different frame of reference, a total different way of life. It's, it's, a, it's a cutoff point from what, what, had, what had preceded in my life, what it, where I had been uh, in charge of my own life, saying I now surrender that, and I am now baptized into a whole new dimension of life in the name of Jesus. Okay? And as you go through then the rest of the book of Acts, every time you come to a, to a time when uh, uh, someone was, uh, came to faith in Jesus, Part of their response, that faith response, was they were baptized. They were baptized. Okay? So upon hearing the good news of Jesus, having their hearts moved, and again, that was the work of the Holy Spirit working in their lives, having heard that, that great good news, believing it, their first response was to obediently offer themselves uh, in, uh, in baptism. Uh, and that's consistent with every conversion experience that you read in the book of Acts. So you can go read the book of Acts and just check that out yourself if you'd like, but uh, just an invitation. So there's a third uh, reason why we uh, do baptism, and particularly why we do it by immersion. And we believe that baptism, <clears throat> especially as an initial response of, of faith in Christ, is a public identification with Jesus. It's where I... Uh, I, I, I often use the uh, analogy. It's like I've had a contract, set, I've had an offer set before me. I've had something, the most greatest good news that uh, I could ever want to do. Now, I can just sit there and think, well, that's a wonderful thing, you know. I wish that was part of my life. You know, it, you, it's, w baptism is that point where I actually sign the contract and say, I'm believing this, and I'm making a public statement about my belief in this Jesus person and my, my following him. Again, probably the person that articulated this the best was Paul in Romans chapter 6. Again, these are all familiar verses, but, you know, Paul talks about baptism. He says, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, again, that whole, that process of, of, of going into a new dimension of life, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Again, baptized into Christ and, and, uh, and fully identifying with all that he claimed to be. But also, in the process of baptism, we kind of reenact his life. And we, we, we are reenacted in, and as we go under the water, it's, like he, uh, it's just like as Jesus entered the tomb. But then on the third day, as he came out of the tomb, we too come out of the tomb, come out of the water into the newness of life, into that resurrection life that uh, he spoke about. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think it's, it becomes for us one of those real touchstones of faith when I can say, you know, there was a day when I waded into the pool, and I, there was an old song, maybe some of you in my house, there's been a mercy killing. The man I used to be been crucified. That's what happened at your baptism. Your old nature, who you were previously, was dead and buried. And you rose into the newness of life as you come up out of the baptistry. It, uh, it's interesting, too. I, I, I remember... Um, I think it was Cy Rogers. Some of you remember Cy Rogers. Uh, had a dramatic conversion to Jesus, and he became an evangelist. He went a lot of places around the world, and he talked about being in Singapore, which is a real eclectic place for uh, religious expression. And um, he said that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of parents were happy for their kids to come along to Christian things, you know, Christian youth group and Christian camps and all that kind of stuff. And the, and the parents never raised any issue around that. But where things got heated and where things got really uh, tense was when those kids became to the point where they believed in Jesus and wanted to be baptized. And that's when the parents said, no way. They understood that there was something very significant happening 
when their children made a step of faith that took them to the point where they were buried with Christ and rose to the newness of life. So, yeah. So, uh, that's just kind of why we baptize, but I guess the issue becomes, well, what about christening? And again, I don't want to step on a landmine here. I, I know that, again, this is... Uh, an issue. I don't want to. I don't want to denigrate anybody's faith. Uh, and uh, yeah, but my personal response about christening is, is that again, when you go to scripture, all the unambiguous examples of people being baptized were those old enough to be able to make a faith decision to repent and be and believe. Somebody didn't do it for them. It was, a, it was a personal, conscious turning of their heart to Christ. And I believe that's something that doesn't happen in a christening. I mean, I, I, I can, uh, I can uh, value that the parents are wanting to do that, but uh, I believe that baptism is always a conscious decision to declare I am switching allegiance. I used to walk in the world. I used to walk according to my own selfish priorities and my own selfish desires. I'm going to switch allegiance. I'm going to surrender to, to Jesus. And now my allegiance and my life is going to be expressed following him. Okay? And I believe that uh, that's something an infant cannot do. So, uh, you know, the I, I remember somebody saying to me, I think that it's right. We don't say that uh, christening is wrong. We say it's impossible. Just because of the... Now, I know that there will be a lot of, uh, of uh, others who will uh, come back hard at me on that. Um, but, you know, too, I think the other thing I, I've seen is... Uh, over the years, and which just has just confirmed my conviction about this, I've known a lot of parents who have never darkened a church door, have never taken their own faith seriously in Christ, but then they have a baby and they think, I've got to get him to church and get him done. And they've used those words, I've got to get him done. It was like it was some kind of magical sort of rite that would somehow confer uh, something just by the fact of doing the rite. Again, Baptism is not magic. God, through his grace and wisdom, uses this water coupled with our own faith response to him to do something dramatic in our lives. It is God responding to that mustard seed often of faith that's in us that makes it effective and efficacious. It's not magic. Christians don't believe in magic, okay? And so uh, I think that that's why all the more reason why we uh, say that uh, it is something that uh, happens to a person when they come to uh, an age where they can make their own faith decision. I've told you about Stephanie, my, my daughter Stephanie, um, eight years old, comes to me one day, goes, Dad, I want to make an appointment with you. Is it that bad? <laughs> but anyway, she made an appointment with me. She sat down in the office and says, I want to be baptized. And we talked about it, and I realized that. Now, did she understand all the nuances of faith in Jesus and all? No. But there was enough faith in her heart, and there was enough in her that she realized this was something she needed to do. So at eight years old, I had the privilege of baptizing her into Christ, and she's kind of turned out okay. You know, she's kind of walking with Jesus, so, yeah. Okay, that's my bit. Anybody want to ask questions or? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? There we go. Um, I just wanted to make a comment just about my own life when uh, I was brought up in the Churches of Christ and then went to another denomination where they didn't baptise. And so those, those years 
of, um, I actually then I did a confirmation class and confer I was confirmed. But then I always thought, well, maybe then, they, then there was the offer of being baptised and I sort of knew from my Church of Christ background to be baptised. Now, as a teenager, I know some of you kids have come back from the Fuse camp and uh, you're all on fire, right? All on fire for God. And, uh, but I actually thought, and I was on fire for God, but I actually thought, oh, I'm, I'm on fire for God, but I really didn't think baptism would really make any difference to my life. But I, I, I just uh, backing up exactly what you've said, that time where I was baptised, that was just a turning point in my life where from that day, it's just like living together and, and then suddenly you're married, you're making that commitment and it really was a pivotal moment in my life. So, but I, and I do admire a lot of people here have got baptised later on in life and it does, it really makes a big difference in your life. So don't, whether you're a young person, whether you're an old person or in between or whatever, you're never too late for baptism mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's just such a wonderful transforming time. That, that reminds me of something else too that I think it's, uh, I, I, I really question, uh, in many, in many places, uh, I believe that when people are come to Christ, the sinner's prayer has replaced baptism. You know, that you pre pray, pray this prayer and, you know, and look, there's nothing wrong with the sinner's prayer. I'm not, I'm, but it's like the sinner's prayer is what you really do and then baptism, well, if you'd like to do that, well, that's kind of a neat option, but uh, no, well, I, again, I go back to to the biblical practice, we find in Acts, everyone who prayed the sinner's prayer, if you want to use it, everyone who came to that point of faith, their first response of obedience to Jesus was to be baptized uh, in him. So, so if you haven't, you know, if you're, if you're weighing up uh, baptism, and uh, look, I want to say that this is, I don't believe personally it's an option. I believe it is a command. And I believe that you should be baptized as you turn to Jesus and, and give public expression to your faith. So, but hey, I'm a preacher, and so I get on my hobby horse. You know, you know. Anything else about baptism? Very little. Almost be a micron difference, probably. Joan. Um, I myself was probably christened, but as I grew up and I, I went to a Church of Christ, which was Mum's church. Um, my dad was Anglican, but he never went there. However, his parents did very much. Now, his father was a very strong Anglican, um, my grandma uh, sort of changed when this daughter went, um, married someone in another church, so she would go there on, um, it was the Sabbath thing, the Sabbath day Adventist thing. Um, now, my question is, those Anglicans that um, don't, baptised by immersion, but believe that they more or less have um, done everything that they can to be, and they are good Christians. Because I can remember <laughs> I'd go and stay with my grandparents and on Saturday we would go to the Seventh-day Adventists and on Sunday grandparents father would take me to the Anglican. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, um, yes, well, I, look, I just wonder, those are good people. They are good Christians. You see, the, with all that they do, they live a Christian life. Yeah. And look, I, I, I'm not denigrating anybody who's been christened. I, you know, because I, I know people full of conviction that, uh, and they have, they have they were, they were christened as an infant. They went through the, the process of confirmation and so forth and have 
uh, are now living uh, the, the life of Jesus. And look, uh, if, they, if, if that's their conviction about their baptism, I can live with that. I can, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say, well, look, you're, you're, Jesus has shut the door of heaven to you because you didn't uh, do it in a particular way. Because really, at the end of the day, um, it is the, the life of Christ that is being manifest in a life through faith. You know? Now, again, I, I don't have any other practice other than what I read in the New Testament. I've got to be convicted about that. But I, I know that others have other convictions. And as long as they're walking with Jesus and, uh, and feel that they, they have an understanding of what's happened in their life and that they feel like they've obeyed Christ through that, well, that's not my call. And I'm happy to live with that. Does that make sense? Jim, just on the um, subject of christening, which is done as a parent, you said somebody wants to take their child and just do their thing. We have the example, I believe, in our Christian churches of dedication. As, and that, So I'm just wanting to encourage any parents or any ones like that, that that opportunity is available for their young children to be brought up until they're of a place where they can make the decision for themselves. Do you want to comment on the Yeah, look, the and dedication? thank you for, that, for reminding me of that. Because, yeah, because that's what we do here is that, and we've, you know, when, uh, often when there are uh, young children, new, newborns often, uh, we invite the parents to, uh, uh, to dedicate their children to the Lord. And basically it's a pledge by the parents to say that uh, as stewards of their young lives, we're going to exemplify Christ to them in the, in the uh, prayer and in the, uh, in the, in, in, with our lives uh, example in the anticipation that there, the day will come when they will make their decision for Jesus. But it's the parents making the decision uh, about for themselves to create an atmosphere, a Christ-like atmosphere around their child. And, and I think that's very valid. So, Okay? Look, we, we could probably go a long time on baptism, but uh, we got another one. <laughs> We want to talk about question number two. What about the story of Abraham being told to sacrifice his son Isaac? Yahoo. <laughs> Let's read the story first, just to remind ourselves. This is Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Ab Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went, up, went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Ab Father Abraham, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. If there is a more awkward 
and challenging story in all of Scripture, I don't know what it is. That story is just harrowing. And it just offends about every modern sensibility that we can imagine. And people who are much deeper in the faith have, have pondered this story and, and just tried to, uh, tried to make sense of it and tried to uh, come to terms with it. And I'll tell you, it does not happen readily. It does not happen easily. This is an awkward story, and there's just no two ways around it, okay? And I think that, you know, as I try to get into this story, I want to say I don't want to try to, to uh, so much explain it. I don't, I don't know that if you explain this story, I think you just walk with it. And you, you as you walk with it and ponder it, there are things that... Uh, that I believe God can speak to us out of this story. Okay? So I'll leave that. And as I, as I got into this, I remembered that I, uh, I read a really wonderful treatment of this story uh, from Eugene Peterson. He's written a book called The Jesus Way, and one of the chapters in there is, uh, is about the story of Abraham and Isaac. And he really sees it as being kind of the... Uh, the, the real pitch point of, uh, of the book of Genesis that uh, Abraham gets to this point. So uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to share what he, uh, or some of what he, he teased out of this, uh, because uh, as Eugene Peterson reflected on this, he saw three uh, important elements in this story that were, are, are worth our wrestling with. And those, those elements are faith, sacrifice, and testing. First of all, faith. And I think when we think about this incident, we need to realize that uh, it comes after a whole series of events in Abraham's life where God has been shaping him by calling him to take steps of faith in his life. Started off with him telling to, to, to leave home and his father. And, I, and then there's just a whole series of, of times where, where God has called Abraham to uh, take another step of faith. And he, here we come to this, which is probably the, uh, the greatest uh, test of, of faith that uh, Abraham would... Uh, would experience and be challenged with. Now, it's interesting to note how both, when you come to the New Testament, both Paul in Romans 4 and the Hebrew writer in chapter 11 hold Abraham up as the exemplar of what it is to have faith in God. Have, you know, the, the Hebrew writer in chapter 11, the faith chapter, writes about a lot of people, but he gives his most, most of his ink to Abraham more than any other uh, one in that particular chapter. Eugene Peterson then says, what did these writers see in Abraham that they named faith? Was it not this lifetime of internalizing the commanding and promising but visible God and then stepping out on the road in obedience? Was it not this readiness to leave wherever he was, leave whatever he had, in order to embrace the vision, the covenant, the command? Was it not a life of responsive openness to God and a matching indifference to whatever conditions he found himself in? Was it not a lifetime disposition to receive God rather than to satisfy himself? Faith is a trusting, obedient life on the road, the way. Faith is a resolute yes to the promises and commands of the living God. And that was Abraham. All through his life. Now, there were some times in Abraham's life when he got it wrong, when he was called to walk in faith and he didn't. But he was living a life. Again, this is, this is the thing about faith. It doesn't just get shaped in a moment. It gets, it gets developed 
over a lifetime of walking in, in trust and obedience with the Lord. And here is Abraham, well into his life, expressing and, and living out the ultimate expression of faith, living in a way where God is embraced and followed. So there's faith. But there's also sacrifice. You know, sacrifice is the readiness to interrupt whatever we are doing. And in that particular place, no matter how good or bad it is, to build an altar. To build an altar. To bind whatever we happen to be carrying with us at that moment, then place it on the altar and wait and see what God wills to do with it. Again, Abraham had practiced a lifetime of sacrifice. It's interesting, as you go through uh, reading about Abraham in Genesis, he had all these kind of places where he built altars. You know, something would happen, he'd build an altar, a place uh, of worship. And see, he, he spent a whole life of developing this ethos of sacrifice in his life. It started with God's command for him to leave his home in Ur and to go to the land that God had promised him. There over and over and over again, he was, he was giving up something. Over and over, he was, he was not, he, God would, would prompt him and, he, and would call to him not to just hold on to, to where you are. Don't just stay safe where you are in this moment. Trust me and go with me. And Abraham would go and he'd leave behind something else, lose something else. Over and over, we see Abraham leaving and relinquishing and abandoning self-rule and embracing God's rule in his life. You know, that's something that Jesus called us to, was it not? That self-relinquishment, that, that call to die to ourselves. Is it that what we pledged when we, when we said that, Jesus, I'm, when, I, when I came to you, when I offered myself in baptism to you, when I believed in you, I'm going to set aside the self-rule that has dominated my life to this point, and I'm establishing you and your rule, your kingdom rule over my life now, and I want to learn how to do this. And, I mean, Abraham is probably an example of, of kingdom life, of learning through uh, repeated sort of processes and incidents, uh, how to walk in faith. And, and part of that, one of the major uh, 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 things about that is sacrifice, of laying more and more things on the altar until you get to that place that Paul talks about, you know, that uh, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to be a living sacrifice. You lay everything that you are on the altar. Okay? So there's sacrifice. And as Abraham did that, he discovered that sacrifice is actually the prerequisite to fulfillment. Didn't Jesus say something like, you know, those who seek to save their lives will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake and the kingdom will find it? Abraham's an example of just that sort of life. There's less of me, but the, le the, the less and less there is of me, the more and more there is space for God to come in and fill my life. And it's a time, finally, of testing. Testing. This is the part we really don't like. But, you know, untested faith is not genuine faith. Untested faith is just a theory. True faith is a faith that's been tested and found that God is able to take you through just such a time. And in that sort of process, you, you uh, are, are built up and, and are able to take even uh, greater steps of trust and faith. Eugene Peterson makes an interesting observation about 
this uh, incident with, uh, with Isaac. He said, you know, when God commanded him to leave Ur, Abraham was abandoning his past. But when he, when he laid and responded to God's command to sacrifice Isaac, he was abandoning his future into the hands of God. After all, Isaac was a son of, of promise. We sing that song, Father Abraham had many sons. Well, it almost ended right here. Abraham wouldn't have had any sons. Potentially. Peterson goes on. We need testing. God tests us. The test results will show whether... We are choosing the way of awe and worship and obedience, which is to say God, or whether, without being aware of it, we are reducing God to our understanding of him so that we can use him. Have we slipped into the habit of insisting that God do what we ask or want or need him to do treating him as an idol designed for our satisfaction. Does God serve us or do we serve God? Do we, do we require a God that we can fully understand and control or are we willing to be obedient to what we do not understand and could never control? Is God a mystery of goodness whom we embrace and trust or is God a formula for getting the most out of life on our terms? The test results will show. It's interesting. I think the Hebrew writer got this. Because Hebrews, again, chapter 11, beginning in verse uh, 17, we, we read these words. He said, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the faith, back from the dead, from death. The test took Abraham to another level of faith. And over a lifetime, he had come to trust God at such a point, to such a degree, that he said, well, Lord, even if I'm going to slay my son on this altar, I believe that you have the power, you're going to do something that I can't even imagine in this horrible moment. But it was a testing. There's one other thing that I think that we could say about Abraham, and uh, it would be this. I believe that in this incident with Isaac, God was showing Abraham the future. Again, God did not summon Abraham to Mount Moriah only to test him. He was showing Abraham what it cost God when he sent his own son up that same mountain for our sakes. Jesus said in John 8 that Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Edmund Clowney writes, Abraham was shown Christ's day. He was taken to the very area where the temple would later stand, to the very mount where the cross of Calvary would be erected. The heavenly father led his beloved up the hill to Golgotha, and when the son, who was always pleasing to the father, cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father paid the price in his silence. Why do we have this story of Abraham and Isaac? I believe part of the reason we have it, so that when we do something like come around this table, there's something in us that ponders again what it took the Father 
to make our salvation possible. You know, when we come to this table, we ought to think about Abraham and Isaac. Think of the agony that would have been in his heart. And I think God was wanting us to understand just what it cost him to make his salvation possible for us. Okay, I've, that's my best shot. Anybody want to comment or ask about that? I mean, this is a... Whew. I think my thoughts are there are lots of stories that we read in the Bible that have a meaning in that time and place that they happen, but we also look at them in retrospect and go, that was prophetic and it spoke to what was going to happen. And if you think about it, Isaac is where the nations came from. Where the, and at that point, if he had died, there would be no, no other nations. But Abraham says, when Isaac says, where, what do we go to sacrifice? Abraham says, God will give us the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. And when you put that forward into the New Testament and into our lives, rather than there never had been any hope for anyone to have relationship with God like Abraham had with God. God provided Jesus to be that sacrificial lamb so that we would have now this family without number. Um, yeah. So that that prophetic bit. Exactly right. It's interesting too that uh, when God did provide the, the, the sacrifice, uh, Abraham's... Uh, response was Jehovah Jireh. He'd learned something significant about God. God didn't mean intend it for evil, but for good. It took an incredible sacrifice to... Uh... I'll close with this. If you have any better questions, you can. I, the first church I worked in in the U.S., uh, we had a family in the church, and uh, their youngest daughter got really critically ill. And uh, they, they took her from our little town, took her to, you know, one of the best hospitals in Chicago. And, uh, you know, she just kept going down and down and down and down. And it was really a really perilous situation. They, they really thought they were, they were going to lose their daughter. And she got so bad that the mother told me um, she finally got to to such a place of desperation, she just prayed over her daughter and said, okay, God, she's yours. You can take her. She said from that moment, she began to get better. Now, I don't want to try to explain that, but I'll tell you, that lady told me that story with a sense of wonder and thanksgiving, and awe, and worship. She didn't tell me as she was really, I don't want to go with God, God. She learned something about God that was deep. She had her own Isaac experience. So. Anything else? <laughs> okay, why don't we, uh, let's sing our closing song. Right? Mm -hmm. Who is like you? This incredible life, this incredible story that you have been called into to live out in your life before the world. Who is like you? And all that God has done on your behalf, all that he has graced to you through his life for you, who is like you? I trust, my friends, as you go into this week that you will live the reality of this wondrous kingdom that you've been made a part of. And may its richness and its joy and its blessing flow in you and through you. God bless you, my friends. Have a great day.